Hello, welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm the host and producer of the Happy Hour, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And I should probably tell folks who don't know, my name is Olga Peters, and I am speaking with regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro as well as Representative Robin Shai, who is the Vice Chair of Appropriations and also one of the sponsors, along with Emily, with a paid family leave medical and medical bill that we are about to discuss here on um, the happy hour. So I'm so glad you can both join me today. Thank you for having us. Uh, before we dive in, just a note to our listeners, we are pre-recording this on uh, January 16th, and since this bill is in the process of beginning its journey, when you hear it on Friday, some things may have changed. Um, but so we're we're talking about how things are on the 16th. Now, Emily, I am excited to talk about this bill with you, but I am a little curious. So the... House uh, or the legislature has tried to put through a paid family leave bill before, uh, 2018 and 2020, I believe. The governor vetoed it both times. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so before we get into the nitty gritty of this bill, I'm just curious what why why now what's different now what's different yeah Yeah. (laughs) that's everyone there (laughs) yeah so that's um every reporter's question (laughs) and very few regular people's questions regular people are just like yay i might have family medical leave insurance and the political question is always what's different now and so i think what's different now is um two big things that we've talked about on the show so much Mm -hmm. One is in the middle aftermath, whatever we're calling this particular phase of the pandemic. In this phase of the pandemic, I think we have all very clearly seen and the vast majority of us experienced Mm -hmm. what life is like without family medical leave insurance. We know that we use the unemployment insurance system early in the pandemic to do a square peg round hole attempt to just keep people from starving to death or um, losing their housing because they were out of work. But that was not an appropriate use of the unemployment insurance system and wasn't enough, didn't, wasn't good enough. And especially even now, we're still seeing a lot of parents um, needing to take time off from work to care for kids who are home because of COVID. We're still seeing a lot of people needing to take um, medical leave for themselves and not have their wages covered. And we're seeing, you know, folks having babies or adopting um, grandkids or fostering and needing to take some real time to attend to their family and attend to bonding. And so there's like the what's different now, like so many more people get it than got it four years ago or six years ago. That's one big one. And the other one that feels different to me um, is that I think the scale of solutions that we're willing to entertain is different for folks. Hmm. Mm -hmm. With all of the federal investment, Mm -hmm. with all of how much we we were able to see like a sort of theory of economics play out. And that's when government spends for the good of the average citizen, people benefit immediately. And it's worth those investments. Mm -hmm. And so we now have sort of a scale that's shifted in Vermont about what's possible in terms of appropriations numbers in terms of program size numbers that I think makes this conversation very different than it was four years ago. But Mm. I um, was not as involved four years ago as Representative Shai was because I was the lead lead sponsor along with Robin this year. And two years ago, the two of us were the two lead sponsors when we were still hoping for Build Back Better to Build Back Better. (laughs) But four years ago, Robin was the lead sponsor when I was just a newbie legislator. So I'd love to hear from you, Robin, what feels different. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, and Emily, I think I think that you've nailed a lot of it. <clears throat> um, that the notion of scale, I mean, our first uh, raft of money from the federal government when the pandemic hit was $1.25 billion. I mean, just think about that for a minute and what and what that means. 
Uh, nothing like that had ever happened in our in our little state. And we, thank you again, Senator Leahy, small state minimum. We had the uh, second most uh, money come in per capita of any place in the country. So that made a huge difference. And, <clears throat> and uh, seeing that when we do things for the good of families and, and, and people, we, it's not just the families that thrive, it's the mm-hmm. communities, it's the businesses. Um, we see the results and the whole economy just uh, is a better place when we, when we spend money for the good of all. Um, we also have, um, you know, in a practical sense, this time around, we have many more people in the legislature who see this as a priority. Mm. And so mm-hmm. truly in in practical numbers, I believe we have enough people, should the governor choose to override it, that I mean to veto it, that we could override his veto, which I wouldn't say about everything. We're not looking to override vetoes just sort of willy-nilly and put stuff out there because we think we have the numbers. But this is such an important bill. And I, I feel more comforted that we don't have a lot of people reluctantly going along. We have people more enthusiastically going along. Right. Uh and understand because they really understand now, thanks to the pandemic. So I think we've all learned something from that. And I would say it's not just thanks to the pandemic, which it is. And I'm really, you know, on my list of reasons, I'm grateful for the pandemic. That's one of them. Um, but also we have a more diverse and a younger legislature than we had before, <clears throat> mm-hmm. as well as more grandparents who have stepped into care for children than we had before. And so the actual makeup of the people making these decisions is different than previously. Um And then since we're recording this, since we're airing this on Friday, I would say um, that on Thursday, in a a hypothetical futures yesterday, (laughs) um, (laughs) we introduced the bill with 104 signatures on it, 104 co-sponsors. And that is a lot of people saying Mm -hmm. yes i this is one of my priorities this session i'm putting my name on this piece of legislation before it even gets to committee yeah so um just uh i i'd love us to run through just some of the nitty-gritty of the bill as i understand it it would help um people have 12 weeks of paid family medical leave it would Funding for this would come through a payroll tax that would be split between employer and employee. It, we're um, calling it, it's a really like an insurance premium. I just okay wanna, insurance yeah, premium point, is that um, politically better than a payroll tax? Well, it's a paid family and medical leave insurance program. Mm-hmm. So it's it is insurance, just like we have health insurance and we have car insurance and we have homeowners insurance. Um, this is this is a family leave and medical insurance program. Thank you, uh, Robin. Uh, so, but what are some other uh, aspects of the the program that if it passes would, would be in effect? Mm-hmm. So there's, um, it's leave for bonding, whether that is bonding with a child who was just born or bonding with a child who just joined the family. Um, there's leave for, your own illness or caring for a loved one. There's a very um, inclusive definition of family that we mm. um, got legislation, legislative language from Colorado um, to work on. And so that feels very exciting for me, who's in sort of has always been an unconventional family arrangements um, or non-normative, I guess I don't want to call it <laughs> conventional. Um, and then we also included safe leave. So if you've experienced domestic violence, leave to, um, care for yourself and your family through that process Mm -hmm. leave for deployment um if you have a family member deploying it's a big household transition so leave Mm -hmm. for that what else robin did i leave well this is not this is also for the Mm self-employed that was going to be one of my questions yeah yes not just for uh people who work for somebody else so self-employed folks will be able to opt in Um, should they want to do it? And then they have to do it as I believe they have to commit to three years. And then at the end of three years, I think they can do it annually, but they have to commit to three years when they first opt in. So we have a lot of self-employed folks. And that was one of the big disappointments when we did this four years ago. Um, I think that the Senate version that came back to us that had been taken out. um, And um, anyway, so we've got that 
now. And, and we think that's a pretty important piece and, and um, has a lot of- And support. that includes proprietors. So if someone is the owner of a small business, their employees are covered, um, but they are also covered. Mm, okay. What about folks who work part-time? Yes. Seasonal, part-time, uh, self-employed, full-time, sort of everybody. Mm -hmm. right everybody who works yeah it's it's everybody but um folks who make less than twenty five thousand dollars a year are um are going to receive their contributions back at the end of the year okay though they're still covered right right it's a way of making it's a way of making the rate structure more progressive mm -hmm. yeah so people at the higher end will well it'll all be the same rate but the dollar amount of vision, but we're trying to make sure that people at the, at the lower end of the income scale can also afford uh, afford to do this. So, mm -hmm. and will this insurance plan be managed by a private insurance company? Will it be managed by the state? Like, who's where will this sit? This is an exciting change from the last version too. So. It will be managed publicly, I think, for all the reasons we've talked about on the show before, about how important accountability is um, and that government is incented to do good by its citizens, um, mm -hmm. whereas the private sector provider is often incented to just make a profit, which often means that people don't get the benefits that they need. We talked about that quite a bit in the context of unemployment insurance, I think, maybe mm -hmm. a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, but... Historically, this program has sat in the Department of Labor's office, and mm. I think we all know how much the Department of Labor has been struggling these last few years. And so, excitingly, um, we have asked the Treasurer's office to take oh, on this interesting. program. Yeah, yeah, and that can go sort of, um, they were also beginning to roll out a retirement program. Um, so those are two sort of nice parallel programs that can run. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that ramping this program all up is going to take some in, initial like seed money or in, or uh, investment capital, however you want to call it. So how would, how would this be kind of phased in financially? Well, those startup funds are in Robin's camp over there in the appropriations committee. So I'm going to ask Robin. To well, ask I, I can't speak a lot to it, but as the last time I had looked at the bill, I think that we were talking about doing a one-time, um, initial payment of $20 million hmm. um, to, to um, seed it and get the, get it started up. And then eventually the, you know, the insurance premiums are going to be going and filling it up um, <clears throat> and, and covering it. And that part of that 20 million is for, if I have this right, is for um, general startup costs. So there's going to be IT costs. There are going to be some people costs. Um, and then it's also going to be to help uh, initial sort of down payment, maybe on uh, state employees as well. Is mm -hmm. that we have that right? So, um, so so that'll cover some of that. And then what we what we want to get to is a place where we have um, a nine month reserve. You know, insurance companies have reserves mm -hmm. in case it's catastrophic or whatever. So we'll we want to have a, a minimum of a nine month reserve to cover you know payments out to to beneficiaries, benefits out to folks. Right. Um, and that's another big difference from last time. Right, Robin? So last time around, that startup money became something of a political problem because we had so much less revenue available. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a decent amount of unexpected mm -hmm. revenue that needs to be used for one time costs and not ongoing costs. And this is the startup for this program is certainly a one time cost. Right. It it's still a big chunk of money. I mean, the Absolutely. last time we were talking about a couple million dollars and now we're talking about 10 times that. Um, so there's a gulp happening in, in my throat, uh, <laughs> committee, but, uh, this is, this is a very unique time. In fact, we're going to be hearing, we will have heard by the time this airs, uh, the new, the updated revenue forecast right. for the rest of this going on. And so that will make a difference or, or be comforting in terms of, yes, in fact, you know, we do have, we do have more one-time money than we had expected to have. That's what mm -hmm. I'm guessing. And so that there is some availability for this. Mm -hmm. um, mm, thank you, Robin. And I'm, I know you mentioned that, I, I think Emily, you mentioned that there's a very inclusive definition of family. 
I am always curious about programs like this because I think a lot of folks assume that as a single person with without a, a partner and without children, that I might not need a program like this. Uh, and yet I am a caretaker for um, a parent. And um, of course, myself, as I almost fell off the ladder painting a room the other day, I thought, hmm, that could have been an interesting little tumble. Um, so let's just talk about <laughs> family structures. And it sounds like this will cover single people. It sounds like it will cover... So it would cover Olga, you know, um, I'm going to stay on the edge of revealing the right amount about your personal life. So it would cover, <laughs> um, you know, any time you needed to take off for your own medical needs, right? Mm -hmm. And that would mean that your employer, if they're providing um, leave time right now, would actually have that paid for um, by, this, by the state program. And so your employer could use the money that they might be using right now to cover your leave time to actually cover the pay of someone who might be doing that work while you're gone, which makes mm -hmm. leave, I think, quite relieving when you know someone's actually doing the work. While right. You're gone. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, time you might spend caring for your mother. Absolutely. Time you might have spent previously um, taking someone to treat um, would be covered. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you're in a family relationship where um, someone is not legally a parent, whether that's a parent or a step parent, mm -hmm. um, there's a phrase in there in, in locus parentis. Is that, am I saying that right, Robin? Loco parentis. In loco parentis, um, which is someone who has been in that relationship, basically in a parenting relationship and either as a, the child in that relationship or as the parent in that relationship. Yeah. Mm. And so that really, you know, that covers, it means that we don't have to go into the full wild spectrum of, um, whether fostering was sort of a legal arrangement or a mutual relationship. Um, it covers sort of, you know, aunts who take caretaking responsibilities and then are cared for in their older years. It you know, covers that full range, which I think relieves a lot of the I am helpful. And so one of the things that was in the Colorado definition, and I found it in the a draft of the bill, it says um, to expand this even further and be more inclusive, as shown by the qualified individual, any other individual whom the qualified individual has a significant personal bond that is or is like a family relationship, regardless of biological or legal relationship. Very nice. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That and is so good. it's a real like. I would call it a real queering of the family and a real mm -hmm. experience, um, a real opportunity for the state to acknowledge all of the ways that folks live in these mm -hmm. times. Right. Well, one reason I asked that question too, I, uh, Emily, you and I have talked about how so many of our structures around, especially benefits, um, revolve around some old definitions of what work life looked like, what family life looked like. And, it, people fall through the cracks when they don't mm -hmm. fit the definition perfectly. So yes. thank you for having that. I, that's an exciting definition to me. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's a challenge because you're right. We can't, we can't think of everything. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to say what something is not than what something than all the things that it possibly could be because mm -hmm. there's a lot of permutation. So hopefully that, that last one along with the in logo parentheses sort of covers the remaining Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we've, Emily, you and I have talked about this program before, but I don't think I've ever asked the question quite this way. You know, we have looked out over the landscape of Vermont and asked the question, like, how could Vermont work better for everybody? And we often come back to things like wages and work life and, and that type of thing. How does this program kind of fit into that wider context of making Vermont work better for everyone. I mean, and like why this program and not something, another benefit for workers, um, just kind of looking for context here. I think time to care. Mm -hmm. 
is really one of the most powerful things that we can do as a society living, you know, under um, late stage capitalism or whatever, whatever we want to call these times. Um, and that time to care, not just for other people, not just like, you know, the mother who's burning the candle at, you know, all three ends. Um, but time to care for self, to be cared for. I, I don't think there are things we can, I don't know if there's anything we can do that's sort of a more powerful move to tweak capitalism at the edges to make it more compassionate than to make mm. time for care. Mm -hmm. Thank and to you. make time for care in a way that doesn't, the wage replacement level in this bill is 100% right now. Right. And so that means that folks can afford to take the time. A lot of family leave programs um, nationally and some that have been proposed in Vermont, for instance, the governor's proposal, have a wage replacement level that's low enough that if you're a low wage worker, there's no way you can actually afford to live on that medical leave, family leave um, wage replacement level. And so people don't take it even though it's technically offered to them. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this is like, this is as good as we can do. Yeah. Right. But I agree. And I think that the low uptake, and we've seen this, this 60% is what the governor, governor is saying for six weeks. It's laughable and it's, it's kind of insulting and, and lacks care, mm -hmm. you know, when you about care, it lacks care and consideration for the people who are actually going to need it the most, who can't afford to do it. And, yeah. and how hard is that to say, oh, there's a program available, but I can't use it. You know, it's just they're out of reach because it, it just can't possibly work for me. Mm -hmm. um, and to force people into making those kinds of decisions really exacerbates the problem. It doesn't it doesn't do anything to fix it. Um, and yeah. we did see a few years ago, and I'm sure there's more data that we could get um, on this, that the states that had the low percentage, like the 60 percent. Mm -hmm. had very low uptake and 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 it wasn't accomplishing their goals. So once they increased the percentage of the salary, uh, the wage replacement that they got, the uptake would increase because mm -hmm. people could afford to do it. And and, you know, if employees are um, are happy, this this reduces turnover for businesses, which saves them money. It increases loyalty to the business. This is a recruitment tool. For businesses, I mean, we have this set up now that the premium is paid 50-50 between the worker and the employer, mm -hmm. but the employer could choose to say, I'll pay all of it. You know, mm -hmm. so if you're looking at jobs between two different companies and one will pay all of it and the other one is only going to pay half, that may sway you. So there's a, there's an ability for employers to have some control over um, over what they would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a lot of good reasons for yeah. Well, what excites me too about that 100% wage coverage is it's very annoying <clears throat> to pay into a program and then not be able to benefit from it. Times in my life where my health insurance has let, Olga, you were frozen, so I'm going to finish your sentence based on my own image. Yes, um, thank you. That, you know, when I've had health insurance that under insured me to a point where I couldn't afford to get the tests that I needed or get the mm -hmm. treatment I needed. I know lots and lots of people throughout the country, right, who are experiencing that right now. So it's incredibly frustrating to be paying into a system that you can't mm -hmm. access because you can't afford what access looks like. And this is, if we're going to create something new, why would we create something that just um, has the same bad policies built in? That's something where, you know. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So thank you for that 100% wage coverage. Uh, we have just about five minutes before the end of uh, the first half of the show. What is really important for people to understand at this stage? Well, I think it's helpful for people to just like know, I know that our, alerts, our listeners really in, somehow enjoy when I do a little bit of process 101. So is it helpful for me to do that? Sure. Okay. So on Thursday, which is the um, going to be in the past when the show air airs, um, the bill will be introduced on the floor with, as I said, the 104 signatures. That's called first reading. It will then be referred to a policy committee, and that will likely be the House General Committee, um, which handles 
tends to handle labor issues. And in that committee, it will then be picked up for testimony, which is called second, uh, sorry, that's not called second reading. It'll just be picked up for testimony. It will have mm -hmm. its time. Um, that's a really good opportunity if folks have testimony that they want to share about how this would impact their lives. Mm -hmm. That's a really great opportunity for folks to get involved in the process in any direction. And so please reach out. Mm -hmm. um, Robin and I have a list running of folks who would be helpful to testify. Um, so that's the opportunity for a lot of the storytelling, the nitty gritty, how will this improve my life? How might this um, particular way this is structured actually I think keep me from being able to use this program the way it's designed for you know both employers and employees um, workers and so that's that opportunity when the committee is done with that and likely they will edit it significantly and vote it out of that committee it will then get referred to the two money committees so then it will go to the ways and means committee it'll go back to the floor and the speaker will refer to the ways and means committee the ways and means committee where i sit will spend time going deep into the revenue creation part of it. So that's the designing the insurance mm -hmm. premium system. We'll spend time with that piece of the bill. And then we will vote it out ourselves if we all agree to, or actually if the majority of us agree to. Mm -hmm. And then it will go back to the floor again. And then the speaker will again refer it to a money committee. Mm -hmm. And it will go to the appropriations committee. Mm -hmm. where Robin will help guide it to make sure those initial um, appropriations that we talked about for the startup money and any staff positions are approved. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the appropriations committee says, you know, the majority of them think this is a good idea as they have changed it, it will go to the house floor. The house floor will vote on it. The majority of house members that's called second reading. Mm -hmm. That's where most of the debate happens on the floor, the political theater. Then there'll be a second vote the next day called third reading. That's a minimum of debate usually, but this one's big enough. It might get a good debate both days. House passes it, it gets messaged over to the Senate and then the exact same process happens over in the Senate. And then it gets sent back to us for us to reconcile all the differences. And then likely we have a conference committee where we reconcile differences. And then after that, it goes to the governor and the governor has a certain number of days to decide if, the governor is going to sign it, mm -hmm. let it pass into law without signature or veto it. Mm -hmm. If the governor vetoes it, it goes back. We can't change it. We can right. just vote yes or no about overriding the veto. Both bodies need to do that. And that is the story of the bill's future. There you go. Thank you, Emily. And Robin, anything you want to add to that about or any other details you think people should understand at this time? Um, I think, I feel like we've pretty well covered everything. If people want to read the bill, once it is introduced, mm -hmm. uh, you can go to the House General and, Mili uh, General and Housing Committee, um, and the bill will be there. It also will be in probably in our House calendar, uh, or journal, uh, at some point, but they can go, we don't have a number yet. We'll right. have a number by the time this is aired, but we don't know what that is, but they could, they could go to the General Assembly website and go to the House General committee page and they'll find the bill there so people can read it mm -hmm. um, and then the agenda they if they want to follow along check the agenda for that committee for a while and then once it's out of there start checking the agenda for ways and means and then appropriations so they people can follow yes um, yeah and there's places too through the the legislators website if you want to give testimony isn't there a way to you either can submit, submit written test you can yeah. submit written testimony to the committee while they're um debating a bill it's definitely not the most effective way to get your voice heard okay um and so um testifying in person is always a little bit more effective but mm -hmm. you can always email the committee assistant um which is listed on each committee page if you have if you are submitting written testimony wonderful and i would just add for our listeners uh we often talk about reaching out uh, to our representatives or our senators when when there is a bill that's important to us. But I want to remind folks, regardless of where you sit on, on this particular insurance program, I would argue that it would probably behoove the governor to also hear from you, uh, since he has been such a major part of this process the last two times it went through. And uh, you can contact him through his website as well. Um, Thank Anna. you for saying that. That would be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and also want to remind people, 
I think our tendency here in 2023 is to tell someone when we don't like something, mm -hmm. but maybe not spend as much time telling people when we do like something. I would say the negative emails I get far outweigh the positive emails. And um, I don't think that's actually about me. So <laughs> I'm sure really <laughs> encourage folks. Like if you think this is a good idea and you're excited, please tell someone that too. It really just like gives some heart to the process. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Representative Robin Shai, uh, thank you for joining us for this first segment of the show. And um Look forward to hearing how the bill progresses through the, the state house. Thanks for having me. Great to talk to you, Olga. The Vermont, the Montpelier happy hour will return on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro right after we hear from some of our underwriters. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and if you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser, who is the regular contributor, as well as one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro. Um, and when this go this recording goes online, I hope you will check out the first half of the show where we talked with Representative Robin Shai about uh, upcoming legislation around paid family medical leave insurance. So, Emily, mm -hmm. what do we remind listeners of? The views and opinions expressed on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, respectively, not the station not the platform, just the people doing the talking. Why, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this episode will go online on Friday, the which I believe is the 20th, but today is sure. the 16th, and um, it is uh, Martin Luther King weekend. And wanted to just touch base with you, Emily, about what you're sitting with as a lawmaker on um, this important weekend. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really struck by Brattleboro used to have really sort of large events um, for Martin Luther King Jr., um, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and didn't this year. Hmm. Um, there was usually there's a really pretty like significant service at the um the white church on main that's street right. yeah. mm -hmm. and that's a community event there's usually something else that's outside somewhere um and this year instead um there was a teach-in hmm. at the library on saturday from the youth who are in the um Gosh, I completely forgot what the club is called, um, but it's the affinity club at the UHS for black kids and kids of color. And it's all um, women and non-binary kid youth, um, mm -hmm. mostly by coincidence, but it added a certain really lovely flavor to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was a two hour community meeting talking about unsung heroes of the civil rights movement, and then spending some time unpacking our own views on race and racism and what to do about it. Hmm. And I, as we're sort of living here in the whitest state in the country, as we work to diversify um, and are, you know, I mean, I'm not diversifying it. I think, you know, people are moving here and it's becoming more diverse. People are right. having babies and it's becoming more diverse. Um, as that happens, I sort of appreciated this move um, this year from sort of the, the celebrations of the white liberal, which I think Reverend King had many things to say about, um, <laughs> to a balance between self-reflection and action. And so mm. I'm appreciating... I'm appreciating thinking about that. I'm appreciating mm -hmm. getting ready to work on that. Um, you know, in that there was, of course, a number of folks working in the legislature on racial justice issues before um, this recent this recent 
mid pandemic racial awakening that we've had across the country. Right. Um, but then there was sort of a wave of a, you know, call to arms, call to action. Um, mm-hmm. And as that sort of recesses a little bit, I think we are wrestling with what sort of long-term systemic change looks like integrating this into all of our work, not just sort of, you know, there's the big public wins around um, police reform or mm-hmm. land access. Um, but when we're really doing the work of racial justice um, and unpacking as a government mm-hmm. institutional racism, um, that's harder, longer work. It's looking like really deeply, deeply into policies and practices to see what needs to change. Um, and so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to my colleagues' practice in that, mm-hmm. um, and the community's practice in that. I was also struck at this event, just like how hard it is for folks to listen to Black girls. You mm-hmm. know, there was definitely oh, um, a lot of my professional work um, is my professional paid work, not my professional political work right. is um, about elevating the faces, uh, the voices of black girls um, in youth work nationally. And so it was interesting to sort of, you know, see Brattleboro in that context um, mm-hmm. and see, you know, once again, how much space um, some of the white men in the meeting took up exploring their own stuff interesting. and how patient and tolerant everyone was. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. I guess that's that's some of what I'm sitting with. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, as a lawmaker, you know, a little bit of what you just said also brings me back to that eternal question of when making policy, how do we make sure that as many people are at the table as possible? with what you're sitting with now, is that giving you any insight on how to do that work better or more effectively? Yeah. Last biennium, I helped set up um, a working group of folks who are sort of nominated from around, from counties around the state um, to really advise on that question. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've implemented some of the changes they recommended um, in terms of, setting up sort of norms for testimony, um, creating more environments for folks to give testimony, moving slower with certain legislation, Mm -hmm. um, bringing sort of new voices into the room, um, compensating folks for working group time. Okay. Um, And then even just sort of the pandemic modification making that permanent of having everything be online and zoom and youtube and all of that that's you know that's all a part of it and then i do um i'm holding out some hope that we're actually going to make changes to the reimbursement structure of actually being a legislator Mm -hmm. um which i'm hoping will bring more folks into the actual um lawmaking process as legislators and certainly we do have the most women of color that we've ever had in the state house as legislators this year. And that feels really exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think we've sort of enough time has gone by that each committee is starting to really understand what their role in the process is. Um, mm-hmm. And so when we talk about family medical leave and, you know, in the first half of the show and we talked about, how high the um, reimbursement level needs to be for Mm -hmm. the program to be meaningful. When we don't do that, we know that who is left behind is poor folks and folks of color. And so it's remembering that. And I think um, Dr. King was really, um, especially, you know, closer to the end of his life was Mm -hmm. even more explicit about how economic judge justice yeah, about yeah. economic justice and how deeply that's wrapped up um, and that solidarity around that, how deeply that's wrapped up in the needs of the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. And so that's a lot of what I'm carrying, you know, in ways means thinking about the wealth gap and thinking about that particularly in the context 
of Black folks. Um, those are like really deep um, and subtle policy changes mm -hmm. that I can make and I can do it without making like a huge, huge big deal out of it too. Like it doesn't need to, not everything needs to be a headline bill. Um, right. We can make small changes that actually make a really big difference for people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Um, <laughs> what are you sitting with, Olga? Hmm. Sitting with a, a couple things one thing when we were scheduling today's recording uh, even goes back to last night when you asked me, are you working today or do you have it off? And thinking about how many jobs I've had in my life where when it comes to holidays, the, the answer is always yes. Um, and, and just so I've, I'm kind of thinking, I, I guess for me, it goes to, uh, Reverend King's work around economic justice. And, and I was thinking last night about the number of people who do not have the expansiveness or room to breathe in their economic mm -hmm. life. Um, so I've been sitting with that. And also the idea I, I'm just right now, I'm sitting with what you shared with uh, the Saturday teach in mm -hmm. and um kind of about society and and in some ways when change happens we move forward quite a bit and then in some of the small ways we don't move forward at all mm -hmm. uh and and just that kind of an unevenness of change and how much patience that takes and and how mm -hmm. much willingness to keep coming back um and keep coming back even though the 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 pace of change can be very slow at times like deep systemic change not just surface change um that's that's what i'm sitting with right now yeah i hear that you know it's funny um the organization I do a lot of paid work with um, is, I think, a mi minority white organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting to have those conversations in that context. Um, but thinking about this holiday and Juneteenth and mm -hmm. the fact that, like, somehow it's just like an opportunity for white work, like white, white collar workers to have the day off. Like, where is the justice in that? Yeah. And, and what so, change does that actually make? Yeah. And yeah. so like being more explicit in organizations that like this is a day of service for white folks. Mm -hmm. And this is a day of rest for black folks. Mm -hmm. Rest and community and celebration. Right. And that like. And what. And like organizations need to step up to set those norms. That's not something that each individual person can be responsible for. Mm -hmm. And in a context where like no one is resting enough, what does that mean? Yeah. 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 Mm. So this is a note to us because this this recording kind of just note to listeners snuck up on both Emily and I, um, but deeply, deeply. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's make a note to us to be a little more intentional about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day for 2024. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. Um. There's also a lot of other stuff that's coming up this week. Yeah, to, this week's going to be busy. There's some reports coming out. And, yeah. and to, uh, tell us about the RAND study. Yeah, so all of the things that are happening this week could all deserve a full hour show. So <laughs> um, I'm going to go in the order of the days of the week, if that's okay, okay. with you. No, so that's fine. That, that will help my brain. So on Tuesday... Um, the e-board meets or met depending on how you're experiencing time on this podcast. 
I don't think we've ever been like so ridiculous about like the fact that we pre-record. Usually we just pre-record and don't talk about it. <laughs> well, we, anyway. we don't always do so many time sensitive things we on don't. the show. That's yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, the eboard met on Tuesday mm-hmm. and the eboard is this um, super dorky, super cool thing, which stands for emergency board. And it's called the emergency board because it is a body um, a statutory body that can make financial decisions on behalf of the legislature and the administration in situations where those bodies can't convene. Ah, And so that's something that was like very useful in the pandemic or or Hurricane Irene or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But the other thing that the e-board does, and the e-board is made up of the governor and then the chairs of the four money committees. And the money mm-hmm. committees are the two tax setting committees, finance and ways and means, and the two appropriations committees. So that's the e-board, five of us. I am now on the e-board. And the other thing that the e-board does, the main thing the e-board does, is approve the joint revenue forecast. So oh, in okay. order for a state to design its budget, you need to know how much money you have to spend right now we could argue and i will argue i'm happy to argue i think it's actually true (laughs) that it'd be better to um, draft a budget based on how much you need and then find the money for it or at least a balancing act between those two things but um we tend to do our state budgets based on how much money is available right and so in a lot of states that don't have a joint revenue forecast there's one revenue forecast from the administration and one revenue forecast from the legislature and what that looks like is the two bodies, um, the administration and the legislature, draft their budgets based on different projections of how much money is available. And so the bottom line of those two budgets that needs to be reconciled. What? Ridiculous. Wow. So in one of the many ways that Vermont is just like so civil compared to the rest of the country, which we can argue is just because we're the whitest state in the country, but we're not <laughs> going to do that today, maybe we engage in a joint revenue forecasting process. So the state economists and the legislative economists get together, spend a whole lot of time in a room together and come up with a joint forecast based on all kinds of really cool economic modeling. Mm -hmm. And then twice a year, they reveal those revenue forecasts for the various funds and tell us what they think the economy is going to be doing for the next couple of years that should impact our budgeting and Mm -hmm. revenue raising process. And so that happens on Tuesday or happened on Tuesday. And that's um it all happens like in the governor's ceremonial office everyone sits in a velvet chair and the media comes and it's all like very that's right it's very yep yep and so that happened um and um yeah Mm -hmm. and And, um i can't i'm in an awkward position where i'm not allowed to reveal what they're gonna say until they say it even though we're after the facts maybe we can put like a show note on that one olga i'm sorry um well we should probably talk about it at an upcoming show too that's yes but what i will say is that you know um the legislative economist did some sort of economic updating when we had a joint session right before the session before the legislative session started Mm -hmm. um in december and he talked about how while the sort of big bubble of federal money is going away that doesn't mean that we're gonna like dive deep into the tank. We're still gonna have more revenue than we did pre-pandemic. And it will be sort of following a growth curve that might be the same shape as the growth curve before the pandemic, but it's being reset at a higher level than it was pre-pandemic. Interesting. So we've sort of like jumped jumped thresholds Mm -hmm. um, around what the new normal is. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and then there's lots of other stuff that we can talk about another time. And then the other thing that's really exciting that's happening this week, last week, is... <laughs> that's the new name of our show. <laughs> this week, last week. I kind of love it. We call the Montpelier Happy Hour. This week, last week. This week, last week. How it all shook out. Um, maybe that's what I'll call my newsletter this week. Um, <laughs> I like anyway, it. Um, is the child financing study from the Rand Corporation. So... Mm-hmm. Um, as we've talked about on the show before, the legislature put in statute last biennium that no family should pay more than 10% for their child care. 
Yes. And a bunch of other stuff about um, living wages for childcare employees and a quality, high quality system. Mm -hmm. And so that we set that intent very clearly in statute. And then the question is like, how do we actually make that happen? Right. So our joint fiscal office commissioned a really massive study that explored the cost of care Mm -hmm. and the resources that families have available to pay for that cost of care. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're sort of waiting on that study to make our next decisions about how much revenue we need to raise to really drastically reinvent our childcare system, um, what governance decisions we need to make to drastically um, update our childcare system. And so that is all happening this week. Mm -hmm. And remind me, Emily, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to this. When we're talking about childcare, we're talking birth to... So right now, Mm -hmm. our public school system covers five-year-olds and up. Okay. And so we're talking about anyone who's under the age of five and we can call it early care and education if we want to use the proper technical term. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that some of the time is spent in care and some of the time is spent in education. It's that caretaking is educational. Right. Like kids learn things in their brain when they're being cared for. Yeah. Um, And so generally that starts at three months. Um, Well, the reason I asked is I I know there's also been conversation about like, when does child care begin and end? And when does the public school system begin and end? And Mm -hmm. where do they overlap? Where do they not? Um, And I think that's going to be a big part of this conversation, this upcoming biennium for um, what systems pay for the care and how does that affect what the care is? So if some ages are being funded through the education fund and through a public school system mm-hmm. of um, education, does that change the actual delivery of services? Right. That right. kind of stuff. It's going to be a fascinating read. It will be. It will be. And I think definitely we should do a show just on mm-hmm. all of that soon. Yeah. Um, and wasn't there, an, was there another report due to come out either around property taxes or ooh yes <laughs> um so actually the task force that I was on this summer on the income based education taxes that report came out um both the tax department's report on that and the committee's report on that came out at the end of December right okay but um next week i believe the office of um, property valuation and review PVR, which is part of the tax department is coming out with a few reports. One of them being their annual PVR report, which one member of my committee is just like, it's his favorite thing that happens all year. And he just like lives for getting that report. Um, But there's a number of accompanying reports this year that dive deeper into certain aspects of property valuation and review. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to diving into that issue. So that is, you know, how we appraise properties, how we adjust the appraisal of properties, how we adjust tax rates to equalize the appraisal of properties with our common level of appraisal, how all those things fit together, how communities handle things in the face of, um, challenging staffing levels Mm -hmm, and all of that. So mm -hmm. that's going to be, you know, there's this really interesting part of that whole puzzle where um, owners of high value properties, of course, have an incentive to challenge the finding of how high a level their property is appraised at. Right. Right. And towns um, often don't have the financial capacity or the human capacity, staffing capacity to defend those appraisal values in court. Hmm. Interesting. And given that a decent share of the property taxes in a given community actually goes to the education fund, not to the municipal fund, the town also doesn't have a real financial interest in defending that property valuation because they don't Fair really point. get the bulk of the money from that property valuation. The state does. Right. And so... Um, we're going to explore more what it takes for the state to support communities um, and defending those property valuations. So that's just like one little nugget of detail on all the fun that happens in the property valuation world. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, <laughs> I love this time of year because it seems like all the reports, like December to maybe the beginning of February, all January these reports. 15th. Yeah, all these reports come through and mm -hmm. uh, they're always full of such interesting information. I kind of wish they came out in like August so everybody had a chance to digest them before you're launched into the policy making. Um, don't even be happy if they came out December 15th all that. <laughs> like that would even be a plus. That it's would be even better. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, just a few minutes before the end of the show, uh, anything else we want to leave listeners with before we, we head out? Um, you know, this weekend I was in town because we had a constituent, we had a constituent meeting for a couple hours on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And then I attended, um, that event from the UHS high schoolers. And then I was going to, um, wait tables in the evening. And so I was in town for like an hour and a half, um, in between those things didn't make okay. sense to go home in between. And so I went to Shinla and I got myself a hot noodle soup and a really cold day. And I read legislative reports, my bowl of hot noodle soup. And I had somehow managed to forget how incredibly comforting the hot noodle soup is from Shinla when you are cold and tired and maybe overwhelmed by the humans. And I just want to give a shout out for occasionally some things don't change. And that's great. <laughs> yes. Yes. The hot noodle soup is a place of comfort at mm -hmm. Shinla's. Yeah. And I um, sort of towards that end of the humans and the overwhelm. I just want to say if folks are running into me in town over these next few weekends, I am making a transition from working from home and barely seeing anyone to being around hundreds and hundreds of people every day. <laughs> and I'm a little bit broken on the weekends. And so I'm trying my best to be friendly, but I am um, a little shell shocked. Yeah. So yeah, the glazed look. There's a glaze. <laughs> I hear you. I used to be that way after deadline night on, you know, yes. Tuesday night at the paper. If I went grocery shopping, people would try to talk to me and I'm like, <laughs> so I hear you, honey. I hope you have time on the weekends to just decompress, mm -hmm. find some time to do that. Well, the Montpelier happy hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, will return next week, Friday at 2 p.m. You can also find us on BCTV and wherever you find your podcasts. And Emily, where can mm -hmm. people find you in the interwebs? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and there you can sign up for my newsletter or follow me on any of my social media accounts or find my email address or phone number. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Have a great weekend. <laughs>